Matthew 24, 34 is a much debated scripture when Jesus says, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. And he's speaking of end time events. So people debate, what is this generation? Is it the people that were alive at the time that Jesus spoke these words? Is it the Jewish race in general? Is it the people who will be alive at the time of his second coming? What is this generation? I want to step back from the specifics that we usually hear regarding this debate and just look at the simple narrative. Because sometimes we're so busy trying to prove our point that we miss the flow of thought. This is Jesus speaking here. And I want you to notice that he says, Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So let's just think about that for a minute. If I take those two verses in context of what's happening and I read them together, I hear Jesus use the phrase pass away three different times. First of all, he says, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Then he says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So I think what Jesus is trying to emphasize is there are things that have an end point and there are things that do not. All right. And so Jesus is clearly saying, look, this generation won't pass away until, but this generation will pass away. That's what he's trying to get at. This generation will pass away, but it's not going to be until I perform everything that I have said I would during the end times. Then this generation will have an end point. He goes on to say, and right after that, heaven and earth itself will have an end point. The only thing that goes on forever, that doesn't have an end point, that never has to change or shift, is the word of God. That's a wonderful thought. But let's get back to the this generation. So Matthew chapter 24 is a narrative uh, where Jesus is giving signs of the times of the end to his disciples. And he begins in a very general way by talking about wars and famines and earthquakes and betrayals and false teachers and lawlessness. And he says, these are the beginnings of the birth pains. In other words, these things will become more and more frequent and more and more intense. Then he proceeds to get very specific and he talks about what the prophet Daniel spoke of and what the book of Revelation speaks of, the abomination of desolation. When the Antichrist will step into the temple in Jerusalem, the newly built temple, and declare himself to be God and demand to be worshipped. Jesus gets very specific with that part and telling his disciples that the Jews will need to flee into the wilderness during that period of time because that will be the great tribulation period. Then he proceeds to talk about his second coming and all the shaking that will happen in the heavens themselves upon his return. It's on the heels of all those events that he is speaking of where he says in verse 32 that we should learn from the parable of the fig tree. And remember that when its branch becomes tender and it begins to put forth its leaves, we know that summer is near. Jesus says, so you too, when all these things, when you see them, recognize that the Son of Man is near. He's right at the door. So Jesus first advises us to observe seasons. Now, seasons are general periods of time. We might mark them with a particular day on the calendar, but uh, the weather and plant life doesn't always obey our particular date. You know, it can be a little bit chilly at the beginning of summer and a winter can have a warm day and certainly spring uh, really can change on us. But what Jesus is saying is generally, when you see springtime, you know that summer is around the corner. He says, I want you to be aware. I want you to begin thinking about these things when you see the signs. And we certainly are seeing the shadows. Uh, we're seeing the foreshadowing of all of these coming tribulation events in our lifetime. Now they'll grow in frequency and intensity. It's on the heels of him telling us to observe the seasons that he says, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. In other words, 
all of the general season events that I've told you of, the specific event of the Antichrist and the abomination of desolation, my actual return. He says, look, this generation will not come to an end until I've done everything I said I would do because I always fulfill my word. Then he goes on to say, and by the way, the universe itself, heaven and earth will also pass away, but my words will not. And then Jesus gets specific and says concerning the day and hour. Now a day and hour is a lot different than a season. A day and hour is very specific. And he says concerning the day and hour, nobody knows. So you better be ready because it will come suddenly. But yes, you can observe the season. With that all in mind, I want to get back to who this generation is. I believe that what Jesus is trying to say in context is this. There's a day when heaven as we know it and earth as we know it, the universe, outer space, will cease to exist and will be changed. Revelation makes that clear. There's coming a new heaven and new earth. Second Peter chapter 3 makes it clear. This present heaven and earth must be changed. They must be totally remade. And right before Jesus tells us that, he says, I want you to know that this generation also has to pass away. Now, the word in the Greek for generation there doesn't just mean a certain group of people alive at a given time. It can also simply mean in the Greek a period of time, an era that consists of the time involved and the collective amount of persons involved, an age, if you will. Let me give you a specific example. Mark chapter 8, verse 38, Jesus is speaking, and he uses the same Greek word for generation as he does in Matthew 24, right here in Mark 8, 38. He says, whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation... The Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father and with the holy angels. Now, obviously, when Jesus was speaking on earth, we know he couldn't have meant that generation of people alive when he was speaking were going to be alive at his return, and yet he's contrasting his return to this sinful generation. And in that context, what Jesus is saying is society as a whole is sinful and godless. The Bible says Satan is the god of this current age. And so when we look at the period of time in which we live, this age under the sin curse, it is an evil age, whether we talk about the actual times or the people involved. It's, an, it's a sinful generation. I believe that this is the sense in which Jesus is speaking here in Matthew chapter 24. What he's simply trying to say is, not only will the physical heavens and earth need to be changed, need to pass away and be made brand new, but this generation will pass away. Not until every word that I've said is fulfilled, but it will pass away. And so he is emphasizing to us that even though we think society is always going to go on and the world is always going to go on, it's not. It won't until everything he has said has come to its conclusion. Then he will change everything. And when we read in uh, Revelation chapters 20 through 22, it corroborates this. We find that after the great white throne judgment, after the evil people, the rebellious people, the unsaved people of all time, after they have been judged at the great white throne judgment and put in eternal hell, then God brings the new heaven and the new earth. Exactly what Jesus is saying here. Could it be the generation alive at the time of his return? I mean, certainly that will be an evil generation under the Antichrist regime and the great delusion of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. But in general, know this, society as a whole, under the sin curse, under the reign of evil rebellion, is passing away. 
but not until God fulfills all his word.